Well, the Lord gave me a little verse for our times, so I thought I'd share that with you before we start here this morning, see if this thing will work right. There's a peace. Can you all see those words up there? There's a peace that passes all understanding. How many of you know that's true? There's a peace that passes all understanding. Yes, there's a peace when everything goes wrong. It's a peace that only God can give us when our hope in Him is strong. Aren't you thankful for the peace of God? Amen. All right, now we're going to get back into our discussion. Uh, and I want to just review what we've done in Daniel up to this point, And then we're going to jump into chapter 9 here in just a moment. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream here in Daniel chapter 2. And you know the story how that uh, uh, Daniel gave him the interpretation. He said that the head of gold represented him, uh, Babylon. Uh, the arms and uh, breast of silver represented the Persian Empire that would come after him. And then the brass uh, midsection, I guess you'd say, represents the Greek Empire. And then the legs of iron uh, represent the Roman Empire. And then the uh, iron and clay of the feet and the ten toes uh, is the end time kingdom. And I want to clarify something here that I may have, uh, uh, that I want to be sure that we understand here a little bit and because it's going to come up later on and I need to make sure it's clear here. This uh, ten toe, uh, at the time of this uh, feet when the stone cut out of the mountain comes down, uh, first of all notice that that entire statue is standing there uh, in the end time. So while the head represents Babylon and so on down the line, the whole statue together represents the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world. The, there, uh, there are elements and there's aspects of the Babylonian kingdom that are still with us today is the point. And so it, uh, uh, the kingdoms of this world are, are all here. And uh, we, are, we are really, uh, we are living in the time of the feet and toes right now. We're living in the time of the feet and toes right now. So when I say the Antichrist kingdom here, I want to clarify that in this particular vision, the Antichrist is not identified at all. He's not identified at all. Now, we know that he's going to take over that kingdom. So the ten toes, uh, feet and the ten toes, represent the kingdom of the end times that we are in right now. There's going to come a time when the Antichrist is going to come in and take over that, and we're going to talk about that more later this morning. And then in Daniel chapter 7, uh, Daniel has a vision himself, and he sees uh, four beasts rising up, a lion, which represents Babylon also, and a bear, uh, and a leopard, and then again in the end time, a terrible beast with, a, a ten, uh, with uh, iron teeth and ten horns, and then now the Antichrist is identified in this particular vision. He's identified as a little horn uh, that comes up uh, on that uh, uh, final beast there. And then again, Jesus Christ is in the picture. First, he's in the picture as the stone over here. That he's in the picture as the Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days gives him the kingdom. And then Daniel has another vision, and this time it's a ram and a he-goat that are battling, and the he-goat uh, wins out, but then there's, a, uh, there's another development in the time of uh, four kings. A little horn comes up, and he's a fierce king, and we noted that this represents both Antiochus Epiphanes back in the intertestamental period, and Antiochus Epiphanes is a uh, type of uh, the Antichrist who will come in the end because Daniel says it will appear in the time of those four kings and it will be in the end time. So there's two, there's two fulfillments there. There's a double fulfillment there. And then again, Jesus Christ is in the picture. And here he's, uh, he's the prince of princes. So... Just to ha keeping that in mind, we need to keep those things in mind as we go along here. Now, last week, uh, look with me, if you will, in uh, Daniel chapter uh, 9, and I'm going to read uh, verses uh, 24 through 27. We started this last week, but we got to pick up here and go on. Uh, Dan Daniel is told in this, uh, in this vision, he, here's what he is told. Seventy weeks have been declared for your people and your city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, uh, the Prince, there are seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the plaza and the moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have, having nothing and, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Verse 27, he will then make a firm covenant with them, the many of the weak, with many for the weak. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings, and on, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Well, I, I, wonder, what, I wonder what Daniel thought when he first heard that. I wonder what he thought when he first heard that. Well, let's see if we can get some understanding. Now, it, it gets kind of complicated, so follow me closely, and I'll try to go slow where we uh, understand all this. Seventy weeks. Now, if we took this uh, literal weeks, seven times uh, seven weeks would be uh, 490 days. You follow me so far? If you take weeks literally as seven days, and then you multiply that by 70, you come up with 490 days, which would be what? Uh, a little over a little over a year I think about a year and a third okay well now we know that that's not what this means because uh, Messiah certainly did not come in a little over a year from Daniel's time are you following me okay so what we need to understand here is those weeks are uh, are, are seven uh, represent a period represent periods of seven years each one of those weeks represents seven, a period of seven years, a period of seven years. And so if you take that 70 uh, times, uh, well, I just told you that. I forgot that was on my slide to tell you the truth. Uh, 70 units of seven years means this whole thing is 490 years. The whole prophecy is 490 years, okay? Now, uh, and notice uh, who the decree is for. Who the decree is for. The decree is upon your people and for your holy city. It's upon your people, Daniel, and your holy city. Well, Daniel's people uh, was Israel, and his holy city was Jerusalem. So this decree especially pertains, everybody in the world will be greatly affected by it, but it pertains especially to Israel, God's chosen people, and the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, uh, there's six things that Daniel's told that will be accomplished during these 490 years. Here's the purpose of those 490 years. To finish the transgression. And I interpret this to mean uh, Satan and man's rebellion against God uh, uh, to finish in other words God is going to completely deal with evil he's going to completely be victorious over evil make an end of sin now what's the difference in finish the transgression and make an end of sin well I'm not you know this is just my idea here I think the the first one is the, is a uh, evil the whole thing of evil but then the sin is the general uh, general uh, immorality of mankind and then make atonement for iniquity now I know I know pretty sure what that one means make atonement for iniquity that's Jesus Christ coming into this world living his life and presenting himself as a sacrifice for sin number four he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness ever bring in everlasting righteousness well now the righteousness uh, has to do with holiness 
And I think what this means is that uh, everything is going to come, everything is going to come into complete conformity with God's holiness. Complete conformity to His holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And then number five, seal up the vision and the prophecy. This is, this is a strange one, as some of the others have been. Seal up the vision and the prophecy. I think for one thing, it simply means that God is going to fulfill everything that He's promised. He's going to do everything He promised. He's going to bring to completion all of His plan. Now these these uh, six things are really al almost saying the same thing over and over again, just a little bit different way and a little bit different aspect. And so that's what we have here. He's going to seal up the vision and the prophecy. He's going to he's going to uh, make sure it's all done. It's closed and finished. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, and so God's uh, completing his ultimate victory over evil. And then number six, anoint the most holy place. Anoint the most holy place. We're going to see when we come to the end of this that Jesus is going to, uh, that, excuse me, God is going to, uh, after the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, God himself is going to come down and make his dwelling place here on earth. And so we're making, this is making preparation for God to come down and make the earth his dwelling place. Okay. Uh, what would be the significance of, uh, to, of this to Daniel back in his time? How would, what have, would Daniel have thought about this? Well, he would actually would have received a rather uh, clear uh, message. Now, it's, it gets complicated, but he actually would have received a very clear message. And we want to receive a very clear message out of, of it eventually too. And here's what he would have understood. He would have understood that God is con in control. Now, Pastor, I agree with you about uh, man having a lot to play in this and uh, man's will is uh, messing with God's will <laughs> uh, in fact the matter of fact is sometimes that God doesn't get his will he's not willing that any perish he's not willing that any perish but unfortunately some are going to perish because man has the has the right to exercise his will and that's what we're seeing going on in our world today that's what we've been seeing going on in the world ever since Adam sinned uh, man exercising his will against God's will but overall God is in control and he's going to finish he's going to take care of business he's going to finish it all up and Daniel's uh, is, I'm sure Daniel's uh, praising the Lord praising the Lord and so uh, Daniel now here's here's where it starts to get complicated so follow me closely Daniel likely would have thought that this 490 years would be continuous He would have had no reason really to think otherwise. He thought it, he would think it would be 490 years continuous. Now, if that had been the case, Cyrus issued his decree, history tells us, in about 537 B.C. 537 B.C. 490 years from 537 would be 47 B.C. Okay? You remember when you're doing B.C., you go down. The next year after 537 B.C. was 536 B.C. Okay? And so you go down 490 years, do your math there. This would all have been totally fulfilled in 47 B.C. All of the 490 years would have been fulfilled in 47 B.C., and how many of you know that was not the case? That's not what happened. God doesn't know what he's talking about. Daniel, was a, Daniel must be a false prophet. <laughs> no, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing and when he's going to do it. He knows what he's doing and when he's going to do it. And so what we find then is this prophecy was not fulfilled in those 490 expected 490 years and so uh, uh, and, and actually when it was actually fulfilled okay 537 BC until when Messiah is cut off now Daniel says uh, the uh, vision was said about Messiah being cut off well if you count the actual years from 537 BC to when Jesus was crucified in about AD 30 that comes up to a total of 567 years. 
Instead of 490, it's 567. As I was saying a while ago, it, it wasn't fulfilled in, in the time that we thought. That's 80, 84 years too many. That's from 47 B.C. to 30 A.D. too much, if you follow what I'm talking about. So what we, what we find out here then is that this 490 years is not continuous. It's not continuous. There are gaps between sections of effective time, what I call effective time. There are gaps of time between effective time. By effective time, I mean when God is, God is doing uh, something special in relationship to Daniel's people. And God is doing something in particular in relationship to Daniel's holy city. God's holy city. You understand what I'm talking about? Effective time. When God is doing something, that's the reason why I wanted you to understand a while ago that it doesn't just say the whole world. It says your people and your holy city. So it's something particular with regard to them that God is doing in these various times. And uh, so 490 uh, effective years when time, when, when progress is being made on this. When God is doing something particular and progress is being made in fulfilling what's to be fulfilled in these 490 years. So, uh, like I say, there's uh, so what we have going on here then is there's a time of effective time and then there's a lapse. Don't count those years. Don't count those years. And then there's effective time again. Count those years. And then there's a lapse of time. Don't count those years. And then there's effective time. Count those years. Now we're going to see this play out. Uh, uh, well, first of all, when you look back at that, uh, those scriptures that I read about the 70 weeks, you notice that the scripture actually indicates that this 490 years might not be continuous because what it says is it's rather it is divided for Daniel in three parts. It's that, it, it, he says seven, seven weeks. If you go back there and read, he says seven weeks. And he talks about that. And then he says 62 weeks, which is 434 years. And then he says, uh, and these two together, uh, 69 weeks uh, equals 483 years. And then he says one week. Do we need to go back and read those scriptures so you, so you see what I'm talking about? This is the way it's stated. He talks about seven weeks, which equals 49 years. And then after that, he talks about 62 weeks, 434 years, and then one week. And so these are effective times. These are when things, three sections of effective time, if you follow me. Now, uh, part one is seven weeks. Now, even and 49 years now it as it turns out even this section is not a continuous it's not continuous you actually have uh it is uh, uh, well let me uh, go back and well maybe i could just remind you but uh these the seven weeks are for the restoring of jerusalem let's see where this is at in uh, let me go back here a little bit um uh, in verse 25, the last part of verse 25, he says uh, these uh, uh, 49 years were for the restoring of the nation of uh, Israel and the restoring of the temple. 49 years for restoring the nation from when, when Cyrus issues the decree, 49 years for restoring the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Now, how that happened, if you look at Scripture, is three main players, three main characters. Zerubbabel for about 22 years. Ezra for about 14 years. Nehemiah for about 13 years. For the total of 49 years. Ezra, 22 years. Excuse me, Zerubbabel, 22 years. Ezra, 14 years. Nehemiah, 13 years. Now, these, this is general general terms there's overlapping and so forth okay so 
uh, the uh, uh, the actual time again the actual time from when Cyrus issued the decree for the people to go back to the homeland and rebuild the temple from the time that he issued that decree in 537 BC it was actually 133 years before that was accomplished it was 100, 130 uh, it was accomplished about 404 BC and 404 from BC from four from 537 BC is 133 years not just the 49 so what's happening here well during that 133 years there were 49 years of effective time when God was actually accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish over that period of 133 years so uh, here's the way this uh, here's the way this looks Zerubbabel's time of 22 years then there was a lapse of so many years here uh, Ezra's time 14 years and then there's a lapse of time here and then there's Nehemiah 13 years and you, if you add all those uh, lapses in there you get that 133 but uh, then now here's the way you look at what happened effective time effective time again is the 49 years are you following me all right I'm just uh, saying if you ever read Daniel and think about these things then you'll I want you to know how this is how all comes out all right all right so part two is the 62 weeks 62 weeks is 434 434 years how does this one play out well from the end of Nehemiah's ministry about 404 BC until Jesus was crucified in about AD 30 is almost exactly 434 years so what you have here is the intertestamental period basically the intertestamental period when the when Jerusalem is restored the temple is restored and they celebrate the cele uh, uh, re uh, all of that and that ends with uh, a Nehemiah's ministry about 404 BC and Jesus is cut off crucified as the uh, said when he would be from the time that, of that until he was until he would be crucified or cut off 434 years so there now there could be uh, some gaps of time in there too but we don't need to try to uh, particularize that because it's roughly comes out to be that 434 years okay now so part one and two together seven weeks 49 years 62 weeks 434 years equals 69 weeks 483 years 483 years 69 weeks and 430 uh, 483 years out of the total 70 weeks and the 490 days so when you come to the crucifixion of Jesus the effective time that is passed here is 483 years out of the 490 that leaves one week or seven years remaining from the time when Jesus was crucified we got one more week we got seven years seven years for this to all be finished up all this prophecy to be finished up well once again we realize there is a gap of time because it did not finish up in AD 37 long ways from that you understand what I'm saying if this would have been continuous time from there to the seven uh, seventh week seven years would have been about four about AD 37 did not happen so uh, well, we know there's a huge lapse of time and we do not know how long that huge lapse of time is going to continue but there is a huge lapse of time between the four the completion of the 483 years to when the next seven years will occur and we are in the present time lapse from Jesus crucifixion to the rapture of the church we are in between the 483 years and the last seven years of Daniel's prophecy here in Daniel chapter 9 uh, so that uh, and we'll learn elsewhere that that one week in fact we're going to go into it here just in a moment 
That one week, a seven-year remaining period, will be fulfilled in what is known as the Great Tribulation. The last week of Daniel's 70 weeks will be fulfilled in a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. So let's talk about what we mean by the Great Tribulation because I don't know how much you've heard, how much you understand, what you know about all of this. I'm sure that, some, that all of you know something about it. But anyway, uh, the Great Tribulation, what is it and when, will it, when does it occur? What is the Great Tribulation and when does it occur? Well, the Great Tribulation refers to a special seven-year period in which God will especially pour out His wrath at the very end of this age. It's a seven-year period, and, re and realize, understand it's, it's a, a special pouring out of God's wrath upon the world. Okay? S seven years. It, Jesus refers to this uh, according to Matthew chapter 24 and Mark 13. Jesus explained to his disciples concerning, concerning these things, concerning the signs of the end time, uh, which we are living in right now. We're living in, in most of Matthew 24 right now. Uh, we're living in that right now. I don't, I, I don't think anybody's going to doubt that. Uh, we're living in lawless times. Are we living in lawless times? Yeah. Are we living in times when there are earthquakes? Yes. Are we living in times when there's wars and rumors of wars? Yes, we are. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, most likely. But... Uh, uh, when Jesus talks about the, end, uh, the signs of the end times, he's not just talking about the last seven years. He's talking about all the time from his crucifixion and uh, ascension back to the Heavenly Father till you come to the end. And so all of these things will be there. And so uh, Jesus' point there was, you better be ready any time. In fact, he, he says that in Matthew 24. Just be ready for it. Just be ready for it. As you see these things happening, make sure you're getting ready, okay? And so... Uh, this uh, the the great tribulation, in my opinion, begins with the rapture of the church. When the church is raptured out of here, as we were talking, I think Sunday last or before, uh, we we're talking about when uh, Paul uh, says in Thessalonians that there's something hindering. He says the spirit of Antichrist. Jesus said the spirit of Antichrist was already present in his time. Paul says it's already strong and present in his time. But if there's something holding back on the spirit of Antichrist. And he says, uh, there's something holding that back. But he says, when that's taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed. And so what is it that's taken out of the way? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. And so when the church is raptured out of here, you know what? When all the salt and all the light is taken out of this world, it's going to get rancid. And it's going to get dark. And the Antichrist is going to come on the scene when the church is raptured out of here. And he, what he's going to do when he comes on, one thing he's going to do when he comes on the scene, as Daniel told us in these 70 weeks, he's going to sign a treaty for that seven years. He's going to sign a treaty for seven years. And let me tell you, if the rapture of the, uh, there's been enough going on so far that if the rapture of the church were to occur, occur today, Within a week's time, you could have that treaty most likely because there would be such chaos and such terribleness in the world that they're going to be looking for somebody to give them the answer. The Antichrist is going to convince them that he has it. And I think that likely they're, they're going to understand that, they don't, that, that, that there's no way they're going to get a, a totally permanent peace thing uh, here. It's, it's just too much. And so what we're going to, uh, in, in fact, agree to is kind of like a ceasefire. And so, they're, in other words, I'm explaining to you why it's going to be a designated seven-year period. We're going to try this for seven years, and everybody's going to agree to it for seven years. And then when we come to the end of this, I think was their thinking, we will be able to get something permanent. But it's interesting to me that it's, why would they sign a treaty for just seven years? Well, I think it would be because they realize they can't get a, a complete one. But anyway... Uh, Antichrist will sign a treaty with many, including Israel. Uh, this is identified, as I've just been saying, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, as the last week of Daniel's 70 weeks, the last seven years. But in the middle of that seven-year period, according to Daniel chapter uh, 9, 27, the Antichrist, and other, and other uh, references in Scripture, uh, the Antichrist will uh, violate that treaty 
He will declare it not void, not valid anymore, and he will march his uh, armies into Jerusalem, and uh, he will stop the sacrifices, uh, uh, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So in the middle of that last seven years, this is what's going to happen. Now, this is referred to as the abomination that maketh desolate or the abomination of desolation. So uh, this, is, this is utter, utter evilness. This is utter uh, uh, dis destruction uh, or uh, contrary to God's, God's will. This is, this is the ultimate. This is the abomination that maketh desolate. This is the abomination of uh, uh, desolation. It, uh, that occurs there. Now, this will be so. The last three and a half years of the uh, tribulation will probably be much more difficult. It will be much more difficult, most likely, than the first three and a half years. It's uh, if people here even here on this earth, uh, if they're unfortunate to not go in the rapture, they're going to think that the, uh, when the tribulation starts, they're going to think it's a really horrible, terrible time because it's going to be a real horrible, terrible time. But they haven't seen it yet until they see the last half of the last three and a half years after the Antichrist comes in and uh, does his thing in Jerusalem. So uh, because of this, some uh, people refer to the first three and a half years as the tribulation and the last three and a half years as the great tribulation. But I usually just refer to the whole thing as the Great Tribulation. But anyway, so so much for that. So uh, I wonder if we have any questions here. Incidentally, if you have a question, me, I'm just steamrolling. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to go slow where everybody understands. But uh, so just interrupt me if you if you have a question. Just uh, raise your hand and let me know that you have a question. All right. All right. Well, it must be done a pretty good job. <laughs> okay moving on here I want to uh, ex after talking about this I want to explain why I believe in what is known as the pre-tribulation rapture view why I believe that the church is going to be raptured out of here before this begins number one I believe in what is known as the imminent return of Christ doctrine the imminent return of Christ. This is what the, uh, all of the apostles and the first century church believed. They believed that from the time of Jesus' ascension back to the Heavenly Father, he talked about coming back. They believed he could come back uh, any time. They believed he could come back, and, and they really, uh, just like us, and just like almost every generation of Christians since then, in the, in the early church and every generation of Christians since then, including me and our time, we expect Jesus to come back any time, including in our lifetime. Amen? Imminent return means Jesus can come any time. There, uh, there will probably will be more prophecies fulfilled between now and when Jesus comes, but we don't know of any that, have, that haven't been fulfilled sufficiently for him to come right now. Okay? Um, and that requires a pre-tribulation rapture view. Now, the, the alternatives are two other rapture views, and uh, most of you probably know about them. Uh, one is the uh, uh, mid-tribulation rapture view and the post-tribulation rapture view. These views contend that Jesus is not, the rapture of the church is not going to take place before the tribulation. It's going to occur in the middle of the tribulation. When... Uh, when Antichrist, uh, right before the Antichrist comes in and destroys Jerusalem, then uh, uh, in that last three and a half years, Jesus is going to come and take the church out according to the mid-tribulation rapture view. There are even some who believe in a post-tribulation rapture view that uh, everybody, including the church, is going to go through the great tribulation. But the problem with those two views is that both of them preclude Jesus coming at any time. Both of those preclude Jesus coming at any time. If you believe in a mid-tribulation rapture view, apparently there's one of two things. Jesus cannot come today because we've got, we got to go three and a half years. Or we are already through three and a half years of the great tribulation, and some might say we have been. <laughs> Do you, yeah. 
Yeah. That's that, yeah, that well that's that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. But uh I I don't want to go through uh, how they come up with their ideas here, but uh you're right. You're exactly right. We believe in the imminent return. We believe Jesus could come today. And therefore, a mid-tribulation rapture view does not allow that. It has to th have three and a half years fulfilled that we're talking about. And we know those have not been fulfilled. Let, let, uh, not the whole thing, let alone the middle. So the only uh, rapture, uh, imminent re rapture view that fits here be, uh, is the pre-tribulation rapture view, okay? Now, uh, a second reason is this. Uh, that which comes upon the earth during the tribulation is not persecution. We need to clarify this. What is coming upon uh, the, uh, uh, the earth during the tribulation is not persecution as some have suggested. What's going to come upon the earth during the tribulation is the wrath of God. There's a difference between persecution and the wrath of God. Persecution is what man inflicts upon us. The wrath of God is what God inflicts upon man. So that uh, uh, persecution, now, now don't get me wrong. Uh, if, there, if there are Christians left here during the tribulation, I think there are possibly uh, uh, will be people maybe getting saved during the tribulation. I, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to kind of. I'm going to try to speculate about all of that. But uh, if there if there were uh, Christians here during the great tribulation, in fact, I guess there will be because some of them will be beheaded during the tribulation. So there's going to be persecution in the tribulation. But the main thing that is going on there is not persecution. It is the wrath of God. Now that's two reasons, and later I'll give you, uh, later I'll give you uh, another one. And I think we're almost out of time here. Let me see what this next slide is, and then we'll decide whether or not we're going to pr proceed on a little bit more. But um, okay, what is what is a proper perspective for us? on this uh, 70 weeks thing. Well, it's real simple, real simple. We don't have to be concerned very much anymore about the 69 weeks and the 483 years. That's history. That's all been fulfilled, was completed when Jesus was crucified and when he ascended back to the Heavenly Father. What we're going to concern ourselves with is the coming uh, seven, uh, final uh, seven years, the rapture of the church. Well, I think we're going to close there. So, what we, folks, I'm telling you, we are getting close to the very end. I've never felt it so strong in my life before. Now, I cannot prophesy. I don't know how much longer it's going to be. But this I know. The characteristics that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24 are getting more and more uh, strong. And we, we all know you never lived in times like we're living in in the United States as we're living in today. There is absolutely unbelievable things going on. Lawlessness which is one of the main things that both Paul and Jesus talked about would be characteristic of the end times is our day and time. There's a city thing set up in Seattle right now as we speak where these people have run everybody out. They've run all the law out. And this lawlessness of going in and just looting everything, lawlessness, we are living in that day. And I believe Jesus, I, I think it's, I think it's going to be a little bit longer. I think it's a little bit, I know he can come today, but I think it's going to be a little bit longer. And I think it's going to get worse before he comes. But I pray, I'm praying that it'll also get better. Because the Bible talks about an ingathering that will come in in the last days. And so what are, what, what's our response? 
our response is, first of all, make sure our hearts and our lives are prepared to be ready when Jesus comes. Number two, do everything we possibly can to warn others and help others to understand and come, uh, and come in. And uh, also, get our hearts and our minds, our minds as well as our hearts. Because the Bible says the, uh, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I'm telling you, the weakness of the flesh is going to come, uh, come to the surface if we get into a serious bad persecution time. So get your, mind, get your heart and your mind ready. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have told us, you have warned us about what is coming, and you've uh, uh, said for us to uh, rely upon you and have peace. Lord God, help us to trust in you, and God, help us to be pre prepared when these times come. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Come back next week, same place, for the next exciting episode.